Our first work in this area comes from ancient Mesopotamia, and it's called the White Temple and its Ziggurat. Remember that the White Temple is the temple on top of the Ziggurat, and the Ziggurat would be made out of mud brick as well as the temple. It's a huge building, and it functions as the city center, and even has the entire city contained inside of it. For content, you have living and religious spaces, obviously, since we see nobles living towards the higher parts, and then the god living on top in the temple. For context, you need to know that this was a theocracy, a, a city which was governed by the god, and the religion was the center of their lives. Now the king and the nobles would act on the god's behalf to rule the people. Our next work comes to us from ancient Egypt, and it is the palette of King Narmer. This is from pre-dynastic Egypt, which means it's one of the earliest works that we have from what we consider ancient Egypt. For form, you have carved stone, and this is supposed to be gray whack, which is meant to last a very long time. For function, it was a grave object, so it was buried with King Narmer, and it was meant for him to use in the afterlife, specifically to hold his makeup that would go around the eye, the eyeliner, right? The palette, the makeup palette of King Narmer. Also for function, it tells a narrative. It has a story of his unification of upper and lower Egypt. For content, we see King Narmer, two gods at the top that look like bulls, different kinds of animals, some with odd necks, uh, and we have different battle scenes. The context for this work is really important because this is the first time that we see both the crown of Lower Egypt and the crown of Upper Egypt being worn together as one headdress by King Narmer. This is possibly the easiest artifact from ancient Egypt to write about because there is so much contained in it. It has a lot of context and you do need to know about Upper and Lower Egypt and everything else that goes with this palette. Our next work is going to take us back to ancient Mesopotamia, where we have votive figures from the square temple at Ishana. For form, you have carved stone, and these are small. They're not life-size. So they're anywhere between two feet tall and maybe six inches tall. For function, these were stand-ins for worshipers that could be left at the temple to eternally pray to the god even when the people were not there. For content, remember you have those open eyes that are looking upwards constantly in worship, clasped hands in prayer, and Mesopotamian beards. The beard representation here is very distinct. It's how you can tell it's Mesopotamian and not Egyptian. For context, you do need to know these were placed at the temple to eternally worship for a family group, probably not an individual person. Next, we'll head back to ancient Egypt to look at the seated scribe. A scribe is someone who writes things down. So for form here, we have carved limestone. Notice this is not gray whack, and he is life-sized. For function, it does house his ka, or his spirit, in the afterlife, and would be buried with the king in order to serve him in the afterlife. For content, remember that this is not an idealized body, but is more realistic and natural. It's also made of less expensive materials, and this shows that the scribe would be more of a commoner than the king would. Next, we'll pop back over to Mesopotamia to look at the standard of Ur. Remember, Ur was a city located in modern-day Iraq or Iran, Middle Eastern area, which means Mesopotamia. For form, this is a relatively small, uh, maybe seven inches tall, wooden sculpture that is inlaid with lapis, or that's that blue stone, and then shells for the white figures. For function, it's actually unknown, but it was probably carried as a banner, even though some people think it was meant to be a music box. For content, this has two different sides, a war side and a peace side. Soldiers march on the war side, and commoners 
uh, have a procession with goods and animals on the peace side, and they're going to a banquet. For context, you can know that this is composite stance. Even though we typically think of composite stance as something that comes from Egypt, we are going to see the crossover here between Egypt and Mesopotamia. Next, we'll look at the Great Pyramids of Giza. This is a really huge, important architectural complex for you to know, and it's very intricate, has lots of different parts. So for starters, these are made out of stone and again have lots of buildings included inside of them or inside of the actual complex. It's a mortuary complex, which means that it has to do with death and memory, burial, but also a worship site for the deceased kings and queens. For content, you need to know that there are three main pyramids, one belonging to Khufu, Khafre, which has the Sphinx, and then Menkara. These were three generations of pharaohs, so a grandfather, a father, and a son. The smaller pyramids and mastabas around the area belong to the queens and maybe different kinds of nobles. It was considered an honor to be buried close to the pharaohs. This is located outside of modern day Cairo and the suburbs of Cairo are actually uh, encroaching on the pyramids, which uh, made UNESCO declare it as a world heritage site and it's being preserved. Please do not write the Khufu Pyramid, all right? Khufu was the Pharaoh's name, just like Khafre and Menkara are the Pharaoh's names. Speaking of the different Pharaoh's names, here you have King Menkara and his queen, a Greywack statue. And remember, Greywack is a very hard, long lasting stone. This was carved to be life sized. For function, it would house the Ka or the spirit of Menkara and his queen all throughout the afterlife. And for content, you can put composite stance, although this is represented in a 3D nature. Uh, he has the traditional headdress and the beard and that expression of wisdom and calm on his face. For context, again, this was meant to last. And so he has this idealized body of having some muscles, but not too many. And that strong Egyptian stance. Skipping back over to Mesopotamia, we have the law code steel of Hammurabi. For form, this is made of stone, obviously. It has an image on top and then the laws written on the bottom half in cuneiform or wedge writing. For function, it does declare the laws, but it also tells a story, which means that it has narrative. For content on the top, that's where you find your narrative. It has Hammurabi with the god receiving the laws, which tells the people that the laws are actually from God and Hammurabi did not make them up by himself. For context, you can remember that this is Mesopotamian and you can remember an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We're pretty familiar with this artwork. Next up, we have the Temple of Amun-Ra and Hippostyle Hall, an Egyptian temple complex. For form, this is, is, is made of stone and obviously it's a complex, which means it's very large. For function, this houses the god on earth, so it would be the dwelling place of Amun-Ra. It also houses the priests that would worship him, and it provides a place for different festivals, both to Amun-Ra, um, but also to creation, the festival of creation, and there was even one for King Tut held here. For content, um, this has the temple to Amun-Ra, but also the gods Mut and Montu. So it has lots of different gods honored here. And the columns are gonna represent the papyrus reeds, which are part of that creation story. For the pylons, you can remember that these are the gates, a monumental gateway, and they represent horizons in the creation story. For context, this is located at a place called Karnak, uh, which is, was in Thebes, the capital of the New Kingdom. It is an extremely sacred space and has a lot of stuff included in it. So don't forget that it's really huge and has all of these different small parts. 
And here we have the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut. Remember that Hatshepsut was the only really important female pharaoh that we know about. And so she crowned herself pharaoh and wore the headdress and the beard just as if she was a male ruler. For form, this temple is carved into the side of a mountain, which means that the further inside the temple you go, the smaller the spaces get and the darker those spaces are going to get, which signify the idea of sacred space. This was a temple meant to worship, worship Hatshepsut. Uh, it was for her cult, her priestesses, priests. She is not actually buried here. For content, you need to know about the statues of her, which are going to represent her ka, and that this has different columns, and that that space is going to get smaller and smaller as you go inside. Next up, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and three daughters. This is a carved stone altar, but it would be a small altar meant for worship in a home, so it's only maybe a foot tall. For content, you need to know the people. Akhenaten is on the left, Nefertiti is on the right, and the god Aten is represented by the sun, and the sun is shining rays onto the people and their daughters, and that is representing the god Aten's blessing. For context, this is from the Amarna period, which remember is a time in Egypt when the god Aten was considered the only god, and Akhenaten was the only person who could represent the god on earth. And we have these elongated figures that become softer, but the Amarna period was short-lived and disappeared pretty much immediately after the pharaoh's death. Next you have what is probably the most popular of our Egyptian works, King Tutankhamun's tomb, and we're going to focus on his innermost coffin. For form, this is made of gold and jewels like sapphires and lapis. Uh, it is an idealized version of the king, and it was meant to preserve his body in this ideal way for the afterlife. For content, you're going to find King Tut's mummy, uh, his actual body, and the treasures which he wanted to take with him, which included chariots and plates and cabinets and all of this golden treasures that was found. Um, this is a significant work because it was found completely intact in the 1920s by a man named Howard Carter, and King Tut was the youngest king of Egypt. He became king when he was about nine years old. So you need to know about Funky Tut. Next we'll have another Egyptian work, The Last Judgment of Hunafer from the Book of the Dead. For form, this is a painted papyrus scroll, not to be confused with the silk scrolls of Asia. It has images and text together, and the text of course is hieroglyphics. For function, this would be to guide the dead into the afterlife, but it also has a story or a narrative. For content, you have Hunafer, the deceased person, and the gods Isis and Osiris, Thoth, Anubis, and the crocodile goddess, or god. And for context, you need to know the story, that he tells his life to all the gods who are listening, and then he his heart is weighed on a scale, and if it's heavier than a feather, he gets eaten by the crocodile, but he doesn't, and he gets to go into the afterlife with Osiris and Isis. Here we have Lamassu, a Mesopotamian guardian of the gates, and he is a 10 foot tall carved figure made of stone with the head of a man, the hooves of a bull, the wings of an eagle, and the body of a lion. Lamassu has five legs because when viewed from the front, you want to see his two legs, and when viewed from the side, you want to see all four. So that makes for a total of five legs. For function, he's the guardian. He would be outside of gates and there would be one on each side, so you would have to walk in between them. For content, you can tell he's Mesopotamian because of that distinct beard, and he also has the wise, calm face. 
This is one of many guardians, and they would be found throughout gates of Babylon and maybe Ur and all of these other cities. The gates were actually really highly decorated, and I have found this picture for you of me at the Ishtar Gate, which is currently in a museum in Berlin, Germany. So here's this for you to enjoy. Okay, keep in mind, I was really excited. This is kind of a big deal. But these gates would probably also have Lama Su outside of them to guard them. Next you have the Athenian Agora. Now remember, this is an outdoor space and has lots of individual buildings included in it. For starters, you're going to have the Pan-Athenaic Way, which is the walkway that leads to the Acropolis out of the bottom right corner. You're also going to have lots of different stoas, which are public buildings, which gives this a public function. Remember, this is the birthplace of democracy, and this work is another symbol of that. That's what you need to know for context. Anyone was allowed to participate in the democracy, and anyone was allowed to be a merchant and kind of hang around in the Athenian Agora. Here we have a Navisos Koros, which may be one of the most important statues in the entire 250. For form, this is a life-sized marble carving, obviously of a male, it functioned as a grave marker, so think of something like a headstone or an urn, but it would stand independently over the grave. For content, he is idealized, muscular but not too much, and it's not a portrait. Uh, it's not a specific portrait of the deceased person, but instead an idealized representation of what the Greeks valued in a man. For context, this is one of many koros and it shows tradition and change. Remember that entire essay we did about moving from Egyptian to Greek to Roman art and sculpture. Next, we're going to have the peplos core or core, which is pretty much the female version of our previous work. For form, she is carved in life-size marble, although she's relatively short or small. And for function, she may have been a grave marker, she may have been a goddess statue, she may have been an offering. She was found on the Acropolis, and there's a lot of things we're not sure about when it comes to the Peplos core. For content, she's idealized, but she's not a portrait, unless she was a portrait of a goddess, which again, we don't know for sure. She's wearing something called a Peplos, which is the garment of ancient Greece for females. And for context, um, she's one of many core or core, and she shows tradition and change also with that archaic smile, very similar to a Navisos Koros. Next, we're going to have the sarcophagus of the spouses. And remember, spouses is a husband and wife, so they are embraced in death as they would have been in life. This loving couple made of terracotta, which is clay. It shows the couple, but they're standing or laying in an awkward position with their feet kind of turned and their hips looking kind of broken. Uh, this would have been made in multiple pieces. The crack down the middle is the pieces being put together. And for function, it's a sarcophagus. It held their bodies in death inside of a tomb. For content, you need to know about the archaic smile on their faces and that they have idealized bodies. This is Etruscan and it also has to do with funeral banquets in which there's often pictures of feasts inside the tombs. Next we have the audience hall or apodana of Darius and Xerxes. This is also sometimes called the Persepolis audience hall. For form, this is a stone palace, but it's huge, almost like a city. And you do need to know that it is located in Persepolis. For function, this represents the power of the patron, and for content, of course, it has rooms for the rulers, governmental spaces, uh, the pro processional frieze, which is carvings of people bringing gifts from all over the realm in a constant array of, of worship, pretty much, to the king. It was originally painted and highly decorated, and of course, it has columns, as you can see. 
For context, this was the capital of the Persian Empire, a huge, very powerful symbol of what Persia represented. Here you have the Temple of Minerva in sculpture of Apollo of Vei. This is a really good example of an Etruscan religious structure, and you would have a stone base with wooden or mud brick building on top, and then gods on top of that. For function, of course, it's sacred space, and for content, you have the Apollo sculpture. Remember, he has that archaic smile. This has Tuscan columns, which are very similar to Doric columns, but have a base. It has a porch out front and three rooms inside. For context, you need to know that the Etruscan religion was very much centered around nature. So that's why we see these natural materials and don't have a lot of these temples that are surviving today. And here you see the tomb of the triclinium, and a triclinium is those three couches or benches that are going to be referred to here. For form, this is a tomb. It was found as if it was a burial chamber, which it was, and inside it has three benches, which were meant for feasting, and on the sides of the tombs, you, you're going to have paintings of dancing and feasting and festivals and celebration. For function, this is all about death and memory, and it is Etruscan, so it's important to remember that in the Etruscan funerary rites, one would sit down in the tomb and have a last meal or a last banquet with the deceased loved one. So it's a celebration of life instead of a mourning of that person's death. Next up, we have the Niobides Crater. And this is important to note that it is one of many craters. A crater is a vessel made out of clay or terracotta that is meant to mix water and wine in the Greek home. So it has a very specific purpose. There are many craters, but there is only one Niobides Crater. And the Niobides Crater tells the story of Nio Niobides. All right, that's kind of hard to pronounce. But the Niobids were the children of Niobidi, and she had 14 children, and she bragged that she was better than the goddess Leto because Leto only had two children, but her children were uh, Apollo and Artemis. So Apollo and Artemis decided to kill all the Niobids, and then somebody decided that was a great story to put on a vase so that they could see it in their homes every day and use it on a daily basis. On the other side of the crater is Heracles and Athena. And remember that Heracles is just the Greek word for Hercules. Heracles and Hercules are the same person. And now we come to the Dorapharos, or the spear bearer. And he, along with the Navisos Koros, is probably the two most important works in the 250. For form, he is idealized, and this is a marble sculpture of, it's a copy of an originally bronze sculpture made by Polykletos. Now, you don't always have to know the artist of these, but you do need to know Polykletos. For function, this was to show off the Greeks' mathematical and artistic genius, and the Romans copied it because they were very prideful of conquering Greece and absorbing their culture and thought that it was just the epitome of good taste and good culture. For content, you do need to know he's idealized, but not in a normal way. He's idealized in a mathematically perfect way in which pi was used to calculate each aspect of his body. And he's standing in contraposto, which is the most relaxed natural stance of the body that we see. And this is a great example of high classical Greek art. You need to know about his perfection, his perfect proportions. He is the best example of the highest level of Greek thinking in the 250. For number 35, we're going to tackle the Acropolis. Now remember, the Acropolis has lots of different things included inside of it. For the Parthenon, this is a marble ionic temple, the main huge building on the face of the Acropolis. 
which is, of course, a huge hill in the middle of the city. The Parthenon functioned as sacred space and had columns, a pediment, that's the triangular shape at the top, with sculptures in the pediment, sometimes called the Elgin Marbles, a frieze running around the top of it, and then originally there was a solid gold statue of Athena inside of the Parthenon. For context, remember this is high classical, all of those sculptures have that wet drapery, highly idealized, and this was built based on mathematic principles, just like the sculptures would have been. As part of the Acropolis and part of the Parthenon, you have this, the Parthenon frieze. It is also carved in marble in high relief, and it's also idealized. For function, you need to know it was decorative. Of course, it runs across the top of the Parthenon, but it's also religious because this is a religious structure. For content, you know it's high classical because it has the wet drapery sculpture on their bodies, and it is a procession of religious worshipers, and that's part of your context. You need to know this is people that would walk up the Pan-Athenaic procession in a, a column towards the Acropolis. They're very solemn because their task is religious and worshiping. This ties together the Athenian Agora and the Acropolis and the Parthenon. Also as part of the Acropolis, you're going to have Victory adjusting her sandal. And this is a statue of Victory, also known as Nike. And she is carved in high relief, but she is part of a frieze, as you can see by her being attached to a solid background. This is made of marble, and of course it's idealized in that high classical style. For function, it was decorative and also religious as this was found outside of the Temple of Nike on the Acropolis. For content, you can put wet drapery. She is wearing almost a see-through toga or robe here, and of course it is Nike or Victory. And for context, you do need to know this is part of a barrier or a railing uh, holding people from falling off of, literally falling off of the Acropolis Hill. And it's one of many Nikes that were carved into these panels. Next you have the grave steel of Hegasso. And remember that a steel is a flat construction. We have many of them in the 250. For form, this is marble, also carved in high relief, also idealized. For function, it is a grave marker right there in the title. And for content, this has Hegaso and her servant presenting her with a dowry box of jewelry. Uh, we did have some trouble over the word dowry, so if you don't remember, it is the gift given to a wife's family by the future husband's family. And for context, you need to know this is high classical. And Hegaso is depicted very similar to the goddess Nike, which is an ode to her status. For number 37, you have the winged victory of Samothrace. And yes, this is again another Nike. Remember that Nike's Roman name is Victory. For form, this is a marble sculpture. Uh, this is idealized, of course, and she's over seven feet tall. For function, this is decorative, but also religious, and would have been located in a temple dedicated to the goddess Nike. For content, she has wings that stretch back. Uh, she is leaning forward as if into the wind, and she is missing her head and arms, but those would have originally been there. For context, this is high classical yet again, and it was originally on a stone ship inside of the temple. Next up, you have the altar of Zeus and Athena at Pergamon. And for form, this is going to be an Ionic temple, an Ionic structure, of course. It is idealized, the figures on the side are, and it's carved from marble and in high relief. For function, this is a sacred space, but it also has a narrative. And for content, you do need to know that the narrative is the gigantomy. It has ionic columns, it has stairs up to the front, and it has the frieze around the bottom. For context, no, this is extremely high classical, the, the epitome of the Hellenistic period. And you need to know the narrative, the gigantomy, the battle between the Olympians versus the Titans. And this is also ties into Alexander the Great's 
conquerings in Pergamon, which is in modern day Turkey. Here you see the House of the Veti, which is literally a house which was found pretty much intact in the destroyed city of Pompeii. This was made out of stone and is a domestic space, uh, like a townhouse or a condo. For function, obviously, it's a living space, but it also exhibits the power of the patron, the person who lived there. And for content, you need to know what a peristylium is. Uh, that's the central area that you see now with columns. In atrium, the columns are Doric, and you're also surrounded by paintings, often of gods and goddesses, and they're still uncovering many of those today. It's super interesting. And of course, because it's a house, you have bedrooms and kitchens and storerooms and all of these things. It's in the 250 because it gives us a great example of what Roman life was like. And here you have the Alexander Mosaic. A mosaic is a picture that's made up of many small tiles and they're put together to make one large picture. So that's part of your form and mosaics would be found on a wall and this one was found in Pompeii. For function it would be decorative and it would also have a narrative or tell a story and that story is the content. This is Darius versus Alexander the Great and it's the turning point in the battle in which Alexander drove Darius, the king of Persia, away from his lands and conquered him. It has horses, chariots, soldiers, and etc. For context, you need to know it was found in Pompeii in, in a house, which represents the power of the patron who lived in that house, because who doesn't like to own fancy art? It also idealizes the victory of Alexander over Darius. And here you're going to have the seated boxer. For form, this is bronze, not marble, and he is emotional but also idealized. For function, this has a narrative. It tells a story, and the story is that of the Olympics. For content, you need to know that our boxer has very beaten features and sloped shoulders as if in extreme fatigue after a fight, and those beaten features are on purpose. They're not from wear and tear, from the ages they were put there originally. It even has small details of gold which represent blood on the boxer's arms. For context, you need to know that Greek sculptures were originally bronze, but they were often copied by Romans in marble, making this original bronze structure extremely rare. Here you have the head of a Roman patrician, or a bust of a Roman politician, or someone who was in the Senate. For form, this is carved out of stone, and you need to know that it is a veristic portrait. Uh, for function, you can put power, power of the patron, and respect of the family's ancestors. He shows wisdom on his face, that calm expression, lots of wrinkles, a very hooked nose, no emotion, he's very serious, and that's showing his seriousness for his job in the Roman political arena. Veristic portrait is a very important vocabulary word here, and it means it has exaggerated characteristics that would be very serious and almost hyper-realistic, kind of the opposite of idealism. On the opposite end of Roman sculpture, we have Augustus of Prima Porta, which is a political work, but is highly idealized. It Not only is it a realistic portrait of him, an idealized one, but it also shows his political ideology and all of his accomplishments, including that as a military leader. He is standing in contrapposto. He is idealized. You do need to know about the symbolism here. So at his foot, is Cupid riding a dolphin, and that's going to represent his descendants from the gods, that he is actually holy in himself. And on his breastplate, it shows pretty much the story of the Pax Romana, which is the hundred-year peace that Augustus brought about. And here's one we all know and love, the Colosseum also known as the Flavian Amphitheater, named after Flavius. 
This is a huge stone or concrete amphitheater. It's a stadium. It has different levels. It was built for entertainment. It was also built to show the power of the patron, the power of Rome, that we have so much money that we can afford to build this. Look at us. We're so rich and powerful. For content, you need to know about the arches, the three column orders, and the stadium type seating. It also would have cages, rooms, tunnels underneath. For context, think gladiatorial games, plays, and it could be flooded for ship battles. Hi, I'm reporting to you live from Charleston, South Carolina, where we are at the house featuring the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian columns in graduating order. So you can see that Roman architecture has influenced the United States and also your state. Now this is the Forum of Trajan and Trajan was another Roman emperor that was kind of turned into a god after his death. So for form you can put stone. Uh, this has lots of columns as architectural features and arches as well, but it also has Trajan's column. For function, you did have a public space for markets, a sacred space to worship Trajan because remember he was turned into a god, and power of the patron, so much power of the patron, uh, death and memory because it also tells his story and in fact on the column it has the narrative of all of his militaristic accomplishments. For content, you can put that narrative. This also had libraries, and it's kind of a large complex in that you have the columns and the market and the square, and it's really very huge. So kind of keep that in mind. It's not just one thing. Trajan's Forum, Trajan's Column, Trajan's Markets is a massive complex which speaks to the power of the patron both during his life and after his death. Our last architectural work here is going to be the Pantheon, a massive building made of stone or concrete. This is a domed building with a religious purpose. It is meant as sacred space, not governmental or public space. For content, you can put the dome, the Corinthian columns out front, the pediment, pediment on top of that, the oculus inside, which allows light in from the top, and inside there would be several niches or small little areas with statues of gods and goddesses for people to worship. You do need to know that this is Roman as distinctly told by those Corinthian columns as opposed to Doric or Ionic. Next up you're going to have the Ludovici battle sarcophagus. For form this is again marble. Uh, it is a box, obviously, it's a sarcophagus, and it's carved in very high relief. The figures which are crowded on the front are idealized when they are Roman, but the content tells us that this is Romans versus Dacians, the bad guys, and the narrative shows the Romans defeating the Dacians. So while the Romans are idealized, the Dacians are shown as uh, evil looking, darker, sadder, uh, hairier. It has a centralized leader in the top center. You can see him there, and he is fearlessly leading the battle against the Roman enemies. For context, you need to know about the Dacians and the defeat of them by Rome. And this gave Rome lots of new land and lots of money.